the following organizations have provided funding for this Into the Outdoors television series. Okay, four toes, claws, pretty long stride. Hey, Zach. Ah! Oh, it's just you. Who'd you expect, Bigfoot? Nah, he's got way bigger feet than these. Hey, no, my feet aren't that big. I'm trying to figure out which animal left these tracks in my yard last night. I've narrowed it down to three possibilities. Which are? A wolverine, an armadillo, or my neighbor's cat, Princess Cuddlekins. Right. Well, could you take a break from that? We just had a question come in from a viewer, and I think you're going to like this one. Hey, Adventure Team. I learned in school the elk were eliminated in my state of Wisconsin for over 130 years. But today, they roam the forest regions in large numbers. My teacher said Native American tribes have something to do with their return. My question is, how did the elk come back, and why? She's right. I remember my friend James talking about how bringing the elk back to Wisconsin was a big deal for his tribe. Great, can you tell us more? Yeah, I bet he can. Then let's go into, into the, the outdoors. outdoors. Grab your gear and let's explore. So I called my friend James. He's part of the Lakota Ray tribe, part of the Ojibwe Nation. He knows someone who can tell us about why the elk are so important to the tribe's culture and the reasons behind bringing them back. Awesome, while you do that, I'll see what I can find out about how the elk came here, where they are today, and who's looking after them. Sounds like a plan, catch you later. See ya. Oh, well, you see, I, I, I gotta go, yeah, yeah. Okay. Before we dive into the question at hand, let's learn more about elk. Elk are one of the largest terrestrial, meaning they live on land, mammals in North America. They're part of the deer family, and perhaps best known for the bull's bugle call, a hair-raising, high-pitched whistle and grunt that carries for more than a mile. Elk are also called wapiti, a name derived from a Shawnee Indian word meaning white rump. Elk are very adaptable and live in a wide range of habitats, from meadows to rainforests and hardwood forests to desert valleys. Before European settlement, an estimated 10 million elk roamed the United States and Canada. But because of unregulated hunting, loss of habitat, and urbanization throughout the 1800s, there were less than 100,000 elk in North America by the early 20th century. And elk east of the Mississippi completely disappeared. But here's some good news. In recent years, restoration programs and conservation groups have successfully reintroduced elk to wilderness areas where they once roamed, particularly in states east of the Mississippi, like Wisconsin. Today, an estimated one million elk live in the western U.S. and Canada. Okay, back to the mission at hand. Hey, James. Hey, Zach, glad you made it. Glad to be here. Oh, I got this elder I want you to meet. He'll help you out with your question. Oh, that would be great. Zach, this is my friend Dennis. Dennis White from the Lacoudere tribe. He's a longtime teacher and a cultural leader. Nice to meet you. Where's you? Where's you? Where's you? Good to see you guys. Thanks so much for having us here. I'm interested in learning more about what bringing the elk back to Wisconsin has done for the Ojibwe tribes. I think it's a symbolic thing of, 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 uh, restoring our, our very ways of life in some way. I mean, I'm really happy that, uh, um, that we, have, we have what we do have. You know? We have our ways and we, have our, we still have our language and we need to spread that further and bring those ways back. Dennis, why was it important that Native tribes be a part of the releasing of the elk and bringing them back? I think it's important because it's, it's part of a reviving of our, of our culture. 
we, we have to we have to keep our culture alive and the, and the parts that aren't 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 alive we have to awaken them somehow that's what the elk being brought back here were, were meant to do was meant to uh, not only just so that uh, people could say we revived the elk but we revived the elk because they were at one time part of us well thank you for for just talking to me just what, giving me information about why why elk is so important to you and your culture. Well, you guys are important to me too, so I'm glad you're here. Don't go away. There's more Into the Outdoors. Find more science smarts at intotheoutdoors.org. And now back into the outdoors. Okay, so I did some digging and it turns out that bringing elk back into Wisconsin was a major team effort between the Ojibwe tribes, the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, and the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. The first group of 25 elk were released in Wisconsin from Michigan in 1995. After being gone for 110 years, wild elk once again roamed the Northwoods of Wisconsin. Efforts began again in 2015 with over 150 Kentucky elk being released in Wisconsin over a five year period. Wow, that sure is a lot of elk. Let's take a look back to the spring of 2019 when the most recent group of Kentucky elk were released here in Wisconsin. We are here because we have uh, 48 new elk coming into our area, right near our reservation here in La Couture Reservation. This is the final year of bringing new animals into the state from, from the state of Kentucky and bringing in some genetic diversity into the herd and providing opportunity for the future generations, um, Wisconsinites, <laughs> it's just, it's amazing. They have to go through a 120-day quarantine period, which started in late January. We have taken thousands of people out into the woods and introduced them not only to elk, but to that whole conservation ethic. This project has gotten thousands of kids off the couch and outside and interested in wildlife. I'm glad that the elk are here, and we go to the next phase of elk reintroduction, and that's let them grow, see what happens, and see how the people of Wisconsin enjoy him over the years. We wanted to make sure that we were involved in every aspect of bringing the elk back. Because anytime you can, can put a piece of the web of life back together, that's always a good thing, getting things back in balance. Whether it's a female elk with a calf or a humongous elk with a big big horns, you know, it, you get that feeling of majesty, I guess, is the word that comes to mind. There's pride there, there's a lot of emotions. And especially when I'm with my son and we see him, and he gets to see him and he's, his eyes get big and he's in awe of them. We're here as uh, some of the tribal communities and Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission to uh, to be here, take part in a ceremony this, this afternoon to, to welcome our relatives, Omashkuz. It's our word for the elk, to welcome, welcome them back to this area. So we're gonna be partaking in, a, in an offering here in a little bit. We've asked uh, one of our, our elders to come down and help to, uh, to bless these grounds and ask that these, uh, these Omashkuzug, these elk, come here and you know, they're, uh, they're able to find the things that they need to, to help survive and to help revitalize the populations here so that maybe one day we'll have full-on, full-on healthy elk herds back in Wisconsin again in these, these areas. welcoming the elk back into Wisconsin has a deep cultural meaning to the Ojibwe tribes. 
But more than that, there's something called treaty rights that gives the tribes an important stake in not just the well-being of the elk, but all the wildlife in the area. To find out more about this, I went to an expert. Travis is a wildlife biologist who also studies the elk. Travis, why are you interested in the animals? Well, I work for an organization called the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. It's also known as Glyphwick. And Glyphwick represents 11 Ojibwe tribes throughout the Western Great Lakes region in portions of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And so part of what we do at Glyphwick is uh, natural resource management um, and stewardship. And so uh, part of those responsibilities includes assisting the tribes with the implementation of treaty rights to hunt, fish, and gather in the region. And so I'm really interested in the elk uh, because it's another one of those resources that the tribes have a lot of interest in. And so we want to make sure that we can maintain a healthy herd going into the future for future generations. Here's what Travis is talking about when he mentions treaty rights. Beginning in 1836, Ojibwe tribes signed a treaty or a contract with the United States government. In return for giving up their land, the tribes were to retain or keep their right to hunt, fish, and gather on the land. Those treaty rights were largely ignored by the government until the mid-1900s when a series of court decisions affirmed the rights of those tribes. So what does it all mean? It means the Ojibwe are entitled to or have the right to resources from the land, including birch bark, maple syrup, fish, animals to hunt and trap, and more. So what's different about the ways the tribes approach elk hunting? The tribes work together, so there's 11 Glyphic member tribes. Um, 10 of those tribes have been participating in the elk hunts in northern Wisconsin. And one way that they've done this, because there's a limited number of tags and, and there's more tribes than, than there are elk tags available, they've taken this intertribal approach. This has led to the establishment of a ceremonial camp where before the elk hunt, they will have an opening ceremony. And so they'll, they'll have drum songs and, and pipe ceremonies. You know, it's, they see it as being more important than just going out and, and harvesting an elk. There's everything involved in the process building up to the hunt and then bringing it back to the community and sharing the elk with the whole community. Don't go away, there's more Into the Outdoors. Find more science smarts at intotheoutdoors.org. And now back, Into the Outdoors. Hmm, I wonder what Aubrey and Zach will be teaching us next. So you may have noticed that we at Into the Outdoors like to drop the words conservation and stewardship a lot when talking about plants and animals. But what do those words really mean? Stewardship means responsibly managing resources, being thoughtful consumers, and protecting the natural environment. Basically, it means taking care of something. And in the case of our planet, we want to take good care of it. With a little education and effort, anyone can be a responsible steward of planet Earth. Conservation means taking action to protect our land and water resources and the plants and animals that depend on them. And as you'll see in our next story, both stewardship and conservation have long been a part of Ojibwe traditions in Wisconsin. It's a team effort, guys. So we want to make sure we, we get some fish, we do a good job, and who's excited? Me. Everybody's excited? Yeah! We've been asked to help out here in the Lakuta community, the community of Odawa Zakaigunin to uh, take out some of our tribal youth um, out spearfishing this evening, out on the Chippewa flowage. <laughs> spearfishing is a traditional form of harvest that our people have conducted for many, many generations. It's a practice where uh, we actually harvest fish at nighttime. Um, we, uh, we harvest what we call ogawag, walleye, and other types and species of fish um, during this time period in the spring and, uh, and harvest them with a spear. Before we go out, we'll be talking to them about the history of this place here. We'll talk a little bit about treaty rights, right? 
why we're, why we're still able to, to carry out these practices. We'll also have a, a segment too about safety. It's very important that we maintain safety while we're, while we're out here. Um, our youth will be issued their permits um, and then we'll be, we'll be going out on the lake and they'll be, uh, they'll be spearing fish, hopefully. Nice. These teachings were passed down from generation to generation. We use uh, a lot of contemporary uh, material these days to harvest our ogawag. Long time ago, they were in birch bark canoes and they used a torch. Nowadays, we have uh, boats and uh, headlamps to harvest our ogawag. It's important for our communities to revitalize these practices and to keep them going. Um, number one, the food sources that come from these harvesting activities are, are really good for our communities. Many times our, our tribal nations um, you know, aren't harvesting just for themselves, right? They're utilizing the, the fish from these waters to, to feed elders, to feed single mothers, to feed uh, our children, our youth, um, to, to feed people that, that need that, that good nourishment and those food sources in their lives. The, the fish also get utilized at ceremonies and other um, cultural practices where um, it's very much appropriate to have those types of foods. We live very busy lifestyles these days and I think it's very important that we always take moments like this to, you know, take a breath, reflect and spend time outdoors because a lot of our, our health, um, both, you know, you know, physical, mental, even spiritual health um, derives from our environment that we that we live in, and so it's a it's a good reminder that these types of uh, events remind us to put away our phones, you know, uh, get off the computer, get away from the TV, and spend some time out here where our people and our ancestors have been for for thousands of years. Conservation efforts are so important when it comes to making sure our land, water, and wildlife stay healthy. After all, we want future generations to enjoy them as much as we do. For more on conservation as it relates to the topic at hand, elk, here's Into the Outdoors Animal Facts with Josh. Thanks, Zach. Elk are quite the conservationists themselves. They live in all sorts of habitats, forests, meadows, and even deserts so they can eat all kinds of different plants. A single elk can't do this all on its own though. Elk travel in large herds, so if you see one elk, you're likely to see even more. The largest herd on record was 11,000 elk strong, traveling from Wyoming to Yellowstone. And now you know your elk. Stay tuned for more after the break. Don't go away, there's more Into the Outdoors. Find more science smarts at IntoTheOutdoors.org. And now back, Into the Outdoors. From the original 25 elk that were released in Wisconsin, there are now nearly 400. But the story doesn't end there. There's tons of work still being done to protect these animals and their habitats. We're here with Josh Spiegel, a wildlife biologist, to tell us more. Josh, how do you track the elk that live in Wisconsin? Sure, there's a, a, a couple different ways we do it. Um, the little more complex way is we do what's called triangulation. It's a uh, base of telemetry in which we shoot bearings and lines from a set point location to determine where an elk is. Another way we do it is the use of GPS tracking collars. Uh, these collars are actually dual purpose and allow us to do both the new and uh, older technology. These collars are fitted on elk. Uh, we try to have a couple per group and that group tends to move around uh, allowing us to see where they're hanging out. So why do we track the elk in the first place? Great question. 
Uh, so a couple of the main reasons we track elk are to um, figure out what ha uh, habitat features they like, uh, where they use, what they thrive in. Um, a lot of our habitat features are dual purpose, both from feeding and grazing to uh, protection, hiding. Um, elk are a herd style animal. It's a safety in numbers type situation. So um, having multiple collars on the landscape covers these different groups and where they move. Uh, another reason is to, to track the longevity and life of these animals. This information will turn around and, and, and uh, give us data uh, on where they like to hang out seasonality wise and uh, throughout the life cycle of that elk. Um, as they move throughout, it gives us an idea of what habitats they prefer and what type or what parts of the year they prefer that habitat in. Data on locations and the types of habitat the elk live in allow Josh and others to make decisions about the landscape that can benefit the herds, like forest management, prescribed burns, and the mowing of grass. Now, let's get a closer look at the tech that makes all of this possible. So what we have here are the tracking collars that we place on our elk. Um, on the left here, you can see the variable high frequency collars. These collars are fixed on the elk and they put out a beeping tone that can differentiate uh, whether that elk is moving or not. Uh, what we're going to in recent years here is a dual function GPS collar. So this has the ability to give us GPS points once every 13 hours and also run 12 hours of daytime VHF so we can still track them in the field uh, uh, real time if we need to. Uh, and the last collar over here, we have two smaller ones. These are the collars that we deploy on our calves. And this collar actually expands as that calf grows. You can see some of the pleating that's popped. The collars kind of look like giant dog collars and kind of almost like they're for a cow. Look how big this is. So you've got all these collars. How do you tell the difference between the elk? Each collar is set with a designated frequency and that frequency is going to be specific to each elk that we have one deployed on. So each one of those collars is almost like a thumbprint, a phone number for that particular elk. I'm glad I don't have one of those collars on. Otherwise, people will be able to find me lickety split. Now that we know how the elk are tracked, can we go try to find one? Sure, I'll use this receiver and our handheld antenna and we'll take a hike down this trail. So go ahead and point that up and you're gonna point that towards the elk, but you'll wanna want to kind of wave it around and see where that signal strength's the strongest. So how would we know if the elk are nearby? So much like the truck, that receiver picks up that frequency of those elk, and that beeping sound is gonna get louder the closer you get to it. After we had been tracking, it was so cool to see a herd off in the distance and get a true understanding of how big they really are, and that was very cool. I've seen really big deer before, but the elk were on a whole nother level. Well, I don't know about you, but I think we answered our viewers' question. And learned a lot about elk and Wisconsin's Native American tribes along the way. I mean, who knew that a species could disappear and then be brought back through conservation efforts and stewardship? Well, now we know, and so do you. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time on Into, Into the, the Outdoors. Outdoors. organizations have provided funding for this Into the Outdoors television series.